Good morning, everybody. I couldn't help but thinking, haven't we got a jolly mood today? How are we celebrating? Isn't it funny? But that's how we feel. I woke up this morning and I says, I'm in a good mood. It's unusual. It was morning, it was raining, but I was in a good mood. <laughs> so why is that? Why is there this level of jollity happening today? Surely today, from a world standard, this is the time when people were feeling ever so slightly deflated. Jesus was dead and buried, according to the traditional view that the world are holding today. He's in his grave. The stone is pushed, locked, sealed. There's a guard on it, both by the Romans and by the temple guards. Everything is in its place. The only ones who really should be happy at this moment in time is the world. And yet, we're filled with joy. That's because those events happened approximately 2,000 years ago. And we know what happened next. And what happened next was astounding. But you know, God doesn't do anything in secret. He never does. And what I want to look at today is how all of this came apart and why. Turn with me for a moment to Isaiah 46, verse 10. Isaiah 46, verse 10. I'll just take a little bit from verse 9 first, but remembering the former things are old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. That just tells us who's speaking. Then we have declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Declaring the end from the very beginning. Sometimes when we read over that, we miss it. We don't quite grasp what has been said there. But yet, throughout the Old and New Testament, God keeps referring to the same thing. That what is happening on the earth are not events that have simply occurred, but are events that he has explored, examined, and looked at in minute detail in advance. Sometime before God created anything, he had a conversation. In that conversation, he made a decision. That decision was to provide his son as the only available or worthy sacrifice that could be made. Sometimes we look at past history and we say, the world's in a terrible place. But God didn't look at our past history. He looked at our immediate future. He looked at the end times. He looked at what people are truly going to be like. He shared it with his church throughout the scriptures. He told the prophets. He told the apostles. He's been telling Christians for generations that the end time will be unlike any other time in human history. But here's the rub. He's not describing the people out there. He's describing the people in here. He's talking about the church. You see, when we read 
that they will be lovers of themselves. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about us. When we read, they will be hard-hearted, difficult to work with, liars, cheats. Again, it's not the world. It's us. He's talking about us. And the question is, why would a God who looks at us decide to give his son Jesus Christ to us? And to understand that, we need to understand what it is that actually took place at the very beginning. The Bible tells us many things. In 1 Peter 1.20, I'm going to read a few verses. You don't have to turn to them. Okay? In 1 Peter 1.20, he said, He, that is Jesus, was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for our sake. First Corinthians 2, 7 and 10. We speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of the age understood it. For it, if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no man has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed to us by his spirit, and the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Timothy 1 verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the ages began. You see what I mean? There is a theme forming here. We keep getting pointed out. This all occurred before God created anything. The foundation. The beginning. He looked at the end from the beginning and made his decision then. As we go through some of these things, some of them is unbelievable. Revelation 13 verse 8. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All those names who have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth will worship him. I mean, the concept is remarkable. But that book is important. Because sometime before it all began, God met and spoke with his son. And he said to him, I'm giving you a book. I'm paraphrasing. Bear with me. In this book is the name of your bride. From all the ages. I'm giving you this book. It's yours. This is my gift to you. Now we sometimes think, well, it's all very nice and all the rest, but does the Bible actually say that? Well, let's find out. Why don't we turn for a moment to John 17. Everybody is familiar with John 17 as being Jesus' prayer for himself and for the church. At this time of year, we hear it on a regular basis. It's an in incessory prayer, intercessory prayer. I want to read this chapter, but I want to do it over the course of the sermon. Okay? So bear with me. Jesus spoke these words, lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. What hour? The one he was expecting, the one he knew about, the one that had been planned from the very beginning. This is the hour that had come. And he said, that your son also may glorify you, as you have glorified your son. Think about that. Jesus is saying, glorify me, now at this hour, 
so I might bring that same glory back to you. And then he said, as you have given him, and he's speaking about himself, Jesus, authority over all flesh, that he might give eternal life to as many as you have given him. When did he give him? At the beginning. They were his, but now they've been given to Jesus. And they are all written in a book. And that's very important to understand. Because once it passed into Jesus' hand, our responsibility has been moved from the Father to the Son. This is very important for us to understand. We are subject to his authority. To what he says. To what he requires. Not what the Father requires. We were the Father's. But he has given us as a gift to his son. Our problem is when we think about this we get a little bit tongue-tied about it. Because we don't, we're not able to put it into the normal reference. That would have been accepted in the ancient past. So let me give you a little example. When Leah and Rebecca married uh, Jacob. Their father gave each of them a handmaiden. That was a female servant in his household as a wedding gift to them. The wedding, the, the, those ladies became their property and were now subject only to those two girls, to Leah and to Rachel. And we know that that authority over them was such that they in turn felt that they were justified in handing these girls over to their husband on, to operate on their behalf to bring them children. This is the level of ownership that I'm talking about. You have been given by the Father to Jesus as a gift, as a bride, as his government, as his possession as his slave property a good word you've been purchased from this world your earthly father sin by the blood of Jesus Christ we looked at that the other day so you're in a completely different setting from anyone else that exists in the world today there is an expectation on how you behave, what you do, and what's expected of you. There's an expectation on you. And yet, when God is looking down throughout history, he focuses on the end time. And what does he find in the end time? What does he find? He finds a church which is described in Revelation 3 as the Laodicean church. Do you know what the name Laodicean means? It's Greek and it's split between two words. Le, as in people. The people, the lady. The seen, as in judge or ones who make judgment. So you are a people who make judgment for yourself as to what you will do, what you will say, how you will act, where you will be, who you will worship and how you will worship. Do you see a little problem with that attitude compared to what you are meant to be? You see, the difficulty is, this is where we run into a problem. As Christians, we don't do what Jesus tells us to do. As Christians, we argue with Jesus. We argue with the Holy Spirit. We argue with God. In fact, as Christians, we would all fall under, if <laughs> you'll like this, <laughs> we would all fall under the condemnation of being heretics. You do know what a biblical definition of a heretic is. It's one that causes division. It's the voice that speaks 
in the middle of the congregation and says, but. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> heretic. <laughs> but the heretic can also be up here. Because anyone who speaks from here and causes division with regard to what is laid down on scripture, in other words, telling lies, not what's in scripture, are also heretics. And that's what occurs in the Laodicean era of the church. I was reading an article the other day, in fact yesterday, and I was just looking up a little bit of information about the background history of when the Laodicean era is believed by theologians to have commenced. And some of them give you this date and some of them give you that date. But I found one that resonated with me. You know, you get that every so often, you get one and you go, ah, this makes sense. The date was 1775 to 1783. Does anyone know what happened in 1775 and 1783? It was the War of Independence for America. Why is that considered to be the beginning of the Laodicean era or final era of the church age? Because what was that war about? What did they want? What is their main aspect that they say they want more than anything else within that time? It was the right to bear arms? No. It was the right to believe whatever they wanted. Freedom of belief. But you've got a wee problem. And here's your wee problem. <laughs> At that time, there was approximately seven to eight individual Christian denominations worldwide, and they all basically agreed on the same thing. Today, that's not the case. In fact, if we step through history over the last 2,000 years up to that date, what we discover is there has always only been a handful of individual Christian denominations in the world at any one time. We know that dominantly that has been either the Catholic Church or the Orthodox, Orthodox Church, etc. We know they're there. We know who they are. Then Protestantism came in and again you had a few there as well. But they all believed the same thing. They all said that this book is correct and that what it says should be obeyed. But after the American independence, that changed. And in America, Everyone was able to determine for themselves what was right. Does that sound familiar? It should, because we're told about it in the book of Judges. Every man in Israel determined for himself what was right. Was God happy with that? Eh, no. It wasn't up to individual people to make that decision. It wasn't their choice. Yet we see that this has happened in our era. And if I was to say to you that there is an estimate, and here's the big the estimate is. Individual Christian denominations, I've got two figures for you. <laughs> One is a conservative 25,000 worldwide. The other is a conservative 34,000 worldwide. The difference is small groups like us. If you count only major church congregations of a certain size, you get that first figure, 25,000. And they don't agree. If you include everybody, 
it goes up a bit further. And that has only happened over the last couple of hundred years. In fact, realistically, it has only happened over the last hundred years. Because the vast majority of the divisions has been happening over that time period. And yet the father, before he created anything, looked and saw our era. He looked and saw the mess that we had gotten ourselves into and his response was Jesus. That was it. Why? What is the wonderful message of salvation that we are meant to be proclaiming to people in this world today? It was very, very simple. Through Jesus Christ, you are made right with God. You don't have to require to keep any days. You don't have to keep any rules or regulations or cultures or specialized, wear specialized clothes. You don't have to be separated from the rest of everything around you. You just have to believe Jesus. And if you believe Jesus, then God puts you into his charge. You might say, well, that's easy. Everyone can do that. No. If your name has not been recorded in that book, that book that was wrote first, before the world came into being, because that's what we read, before the foundation of the world, the Lamb's Book of Life was recorded. If your name was not in that book, you would never be part of the Church of God. You can't be because it won't make any sense to you. Now that causes a lot of stress to people. And it's because they get into their head that this is the only time they're ever going to get an opportunity of salvation. And they don't get it. God never offered you salvation. He offered you an opportunity to become married. He's choosing a bride for his son. He's paid the bridal price. He has done all that is necessary. The work of salvation itself is complete. Nothing else is required. And salvation will be offered to everybody. But you, those written in that book of life, are a bride. Set aside. Given to Christ. Holy. Righteous. Perfect. Maybe you don't like that particular concept. Maybe you don't like the idea that God chose you in advance to be the wife, comforter, helpmate, and constant companion of his son for all eternity. That he saw your lives now and chose you. He picked you out of all the world. He made you the most special of every individual alive. That's what he did. And then he gave you to Jesus. But now you have a problem. In our era, Jesus has a problem. And that problem is with us. And do you know what that problem is? We don't listen to him. Turn into Revelations 3, because I need you to hear this as it's recorded. I'm starting with verse 14 of Revelations 3. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true, the beginning of the creation of God. In other words, he, he begins by telling us who he is. He's faithful. He's true. He was at the beginning of creation. It's all about him. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It is all about him. That's the concept. And he's telling them now, I know who you are. I know your works. I know that you're not hot. And I know that you're not cold. You're lukewarm. I would that you were hot or cold. But because you're neither hot or cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Do you understand that word vomit means expel? 
That's a terrible thing to be considered. Can you imagine the emotion rising in Christ with regard to us? Us. When that is the language he's talking. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to his church, to his bride. The special people set aside for him, for his use, and for this father's most precious gift can be given. And yet Jesus said, I'm going to have to vomit you out. As a church, you just make me sick. You mean? I mean, can you imagine the words? You make me physically sick. Can you think of anything worse to hear than that sort of a statement from the one you are supposed to love, respect, and care for? Something's wrong. Remember, Jesus has slipped. He has seen what the Father, the end, and he knows exactly what we are. Why? Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, I don't need anything. And yet you don't know that in reality you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. He gives us counsel, he says, Buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness not be revealed. Anointment for your eyes that you may see. And then he warns us, as many as I love, I will chastise. He will chastise because he loves us. And he needs us to turn and be an obedient church to him. To be obedient to his requirement. I keep referring back to this book of life. And there's a reason for that. In Revelation 3, <coughs> God speaks of another church, Sardis. And he gives a warning to that church that is absolutely terrifying. It's in verse 5. Of, it's in chapter 3, verse 5. And I will not blot out the names of those who have overcome from my book, the book of life. Now, why did Jesus feel the need to say that? That's because the book's now in his hands. He is the judge. He will make the determination. He makes the final cut. And he could blot out the names of anyone who refuse to accept his lordship over their lives. That's the reality of the situation. We have to realize who we are dealing with. Go back to John 17. John 17. Verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, Jesus referring to the Father, and the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I, that's Jesus, have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work you given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world began. I have manifest your name to men, whom you have given me out of this world. In other words, he's identifying that he's not working with the general public. He's working only with those individuals chosen for him by the Father. And now your Father, I'm oh, sorry. They were yours, and you give them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. We have to believe 
Jesus. We have to accept what he says. We have to be willing to do what he tells us because of where he came from and who he is. That's the gospel message. That's what we're told to do. But then again, people say, I understand that, but you know, he was only talking about the apostles. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the word has hid them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I send them into the world. And for your, their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. But listen to verse 20. I do not pray for these alone. That was his pastors. But for all those who come to know us from their teachings. That the word may believe that you sent me. I do, not pray for those, for, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I just thought I'd re-read it properly. <laughs> Do we get that? Do we understand the importance of this? Verse 22, And the glory which you give me, I have given them. Did we read that just right? I mean, did we surely get, did we read that right? Should we read it again? Yeah. And the glory which you give me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. 25,000 individuals, church belief structures within Christianity, possibly up to 34,000, that are not one. That's our area. That's what we face. Are we obeying Christ? No. We're not doing a thing that he tells us to do. We're standing in total opposition to him. We're saying to him, um, well, personally, I wouldn't do it that way. I would do it this way. Does that sound familiar? Because that's how we, in our era of the Christian church, are addressing God. That's what we're saying to the Holy Spirit. We don't want to do it your way. We think it would be better if we do it our way. So we're going to do it our way. Because at the end of the day, we're here. You're in heaven. We're on the ground. We understand what's happening. Do we realize how dangerous our position as a church and I'm not talking here, I'm talking church on this earth is. We are that close to being taken away as a candlestick of God's glory. We are so close to it, it's not funny. Other churches have come close, but they came through it. But we are a church that will have to go through the period of testing that's going to fall on the rest of this world because we don't get it. Because we don't obey him. Because we're not reflecting his glory. 2,000 years ago, it was finished. 2,000 years ago, it was complete. Christ resurrected. The disciples were terrified. They met him, they talked to him, for 40 days he walked with them, and then they went and they hid. In the upper room, on the day of Pentecost, they were hiding, because they were terrified of what the Jews would do to them. Then the Holy Spirit came, and there was a change. And that change 
was remarkable. These cards who were hiding suddenly became as brave as lions. Filled with the power of God, they went and proclaimed in languages that were given to them supernaturally the power, wisdom and glory of the risen Christ. And 300 people, 3,000 people were converted on that one day. Later there was another 5,000. Somebody will correct me later and see you've got those mixed up. But I'm not worried about that <laughs> at the moment. But we're living in a church era when that doesn't happen. Do you know what the saddest thing that Jesus gave as a message to that end time church? The very saddest thing. It's how he finishes talking to them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Have you ever thought about that? This is the only church area, era, not area, era, where Jesus is outside of the congregation. He's out there because he can't come in here. And he can't come in here because we don't let him. I'm talking about we as in the Christian church, not us as an individual congregation. We won't let him in because we have our ways of running the service. We have our hymns that need to be sung, our prayers that need to be said. We have our literacy, our liturgy that needs to be done. We have all our rules and regulations and when they're all finished, there's no time for anything else, so we go home. And Jesus never got a look in. Over the years, he's been moved further and further and further until finally he's out the door. And now he stands out there knocking. And this is his knock. Every time you hear a message from the Holy Spirit, telling you to think again and restock, that is Christ knocking, asking for you to come back in and talk to him. He wants to come and he wants to share with you. He wants to eat with you. He wants to fellowship with you. But that's not happening. We argue about Easter, Passover, Christmas, all our things. Do you know, as a matter of interest, that this celebration of Easter is an English word. And in other countries, they keep a different named feast, which derives from the word Passover. So if you go to Spain, they don't keep Easter, they keep Pass. Passover, it's, it's based on Passover. In different parts throughout Europe, the same thing happens. You don't keep Easter, you keep a name that is reflective of the original term Passover. It's only the English keeping word that uses Easter. And yet it became a real big problem, but not to God. It's never really been a problem to God. He deals with the heart, not the mind. Start with the heart and the mind will fall into suit. But if the heart doesn't belong to God, if it hasn't yielded to his authority, there's no point. This is one of the big problems that we have with things like arranged marriages. If the person doesn't respect who they're being given to in marriage, well, the relationship's not going to work. Isn't that how we know it is? If a couple are even within an ordinary situation coming towards the point of marriage, but they don't agree with each other, he ignores her or she disrespects him and doesn't value what he has to say. Will the relationship work? Of course not. We know that. Why then do you think our end time church relationship with Jesus Christ before he comes is going to be any different? If we don't yield and accept 
the one who is life, then we can't expect to inherit life. And our names will not remain in that book of life. Because he will make that choice, which isn't really him making it, but us making it on his behalf, that we really don't want to be there. And that's a terrible, terrible way to have to end this. This should be a time of rejoicing. Our soon coming king will be back. The fulfillment and truth of the resurrection should be proclaimed from all churches with joy. We should be telling the world about this wonderful gift. Instead, there is a more danger that his coming back will be to pull us into judgment. He stands at the door knocking. Let's not keep him there. Thank you.